Hello and welcome to the bonus interview of Postcards from the Land of Grief. My name is Elliot Frisby and I'm here with the author Richard Littledale. Richard, thank you for speaking to me right now. Thank you for having me here. So everyone has just listened to your book, which I assume they have, otherwise they've just jumped a whole section of chapters to get to the very end. If not, welcome to this point. (laughs) (laughs) And this is an opportunity to dive into the books, an opportunity for all of them listeners to get something which they wouldn't get by just reading the hardback, okay. which looks very attractive, by the way. Good. Yeah, I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, yeah lovely. And hardback, yeah. which is great. It kind of feels nice to hold in your hand too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and the artwork on the front as well, which they will see in the audiobook cover. Yeah. Why don't you start with that? You were telling me about that tree. Yes. Yeah, so the very last holiday that Fiona and I ever spent together, we went down to Cornwall, not a place either of us knew very well. And near to where we were staying was a little tiny, tiny port called Port Quinn. And just coming up out of the port is a little tiny tree. And it's been blown and buffeted by the wind. But do you know what? It's still growing. And I actually had to stop the car in the middle of the road to get a photo of it because it was so impressive. And that little tree has become a bit of a cipher for me of being plucky, showing courage, keeping going. And it became the cover of the book. The Courage Tree. The Courage Tree. The Courage Tree. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So why did you decide to write postcards in the first place? I didn't originally set out to write a book. I started off by blogging my experiences. A blog for many years has been a place for me to work out what I'm thinking, to begin conversations, to ask questions. And so when I found myself in what I would describe as the foreign country of grief, a foreign land where I didn't feel I fitted in, the most natural thing in the world to me was to articulate that experience. And I thought to myself, well, what do you write when you're away from home? You write a postcard. And so I started writing these reflections on my experiences, which I called postcards. And to my astonishment, they really found an audience. Was this initially as a blog? Started off as a blog, yeah, and people started to find them quite captivating. Uh, By that stage, I was then working once again for Radio 4, and uh, they came to me and said, look, we've seen some of these. We'd like to make them into a programme. And so that's what they did. Uh, We constructed a Sunday worship programme into about 40 minutes And we wove it around a selection of about six of these postcards. And earlier, we were blown away by the response. Well, you do a lot of radio. Um, You do a lot of writing and you're here and everywhere. You have a regular slot on BBC Berkshire. I do. Yes, indeed. um, Which has been going a while now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, pre-postcards, doing the media, the radio side of things, to post postcards, yeah. did you find that perhaps your audience has changed somewhat? Are you pulling in a new new audience? Are you reaching out to new people? Has it changed in any way? I think it has. Um, we Brits are awful at talking about our feelings, and we are especially awful at talking about grief and bereavement. You know, three out of five people in this country will not talk to someone re- who's recently been bereaved because they're mm. so frightened of saying the wrong thing. And so once I kind of took the lid off that, both in written and broadcast media, I think it has attracted a number of people to engage with me. You know, people who feel that they would like to talk about their feelings, but don't quite know how to do so. It's as if postcard in its many different forms, whether the audio book you've just listened to or the print book or the things I've done on the radio, it's as if postcard has given them permission to do that. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have facilitated that. And what about from a Christian perspective as well? Has Do you feel that Postcards has given people also permission to be more open about their Christian faith and explore a little bit deeper that perhaps they wouldn't previously? Very much so. I think we feel a little bit obliged as Christians to have everything very tidy. (laughs) <laughs> and I know I've had people ask me before that, you know, you're a minister. Shouldn't you have coped better with all of this? Shouldn't you be immune to all of this? And, you know, I wasn't. Grief knocked me for six. Grief has changed me. My grief hurts every day. And we're now nearly four years since I lost Fiona. So, again, it's been good to be honest about all that. And so, you know, my hope as a Christian is brighter than it's ever been. My faith is stronger than it's ever been. But that does not mean. That I don't grieve. There's a guy I bump into sometimes who once tried to become a priest and it didn't work out for him. And he'd heard me talking about some of this stuff on the radio. 
And he said, oh, I was quite shocked that a man of the cloth, as he put it, would talk so openly about things being tough. I'm all for that. I think it's good for us. And it was very honest, um, your, yeah. your book. And the way, the way you read it, I mean, uh, we just literally finished producing that book, yeah. haven't we? And um, it was very honest. I think, I think it was great. Um, a question, why do you describe grief as a foreign land? Because I think when, when you go to a foreign country, you find yourself feeling quite inept. The things that you think will be simple, like crossing the road, making a phone call, opening a bank account, doing the shopping, you expect all those things to be simple and all of a sudden they're not. The thing that's odd with the land of grief, as I describe it, is of course it's the place you lived before. I live in the same house I did before Fiona died. But all of a sudden those familiar things have gone through some kind of seismic shift so that they no longer feel familiar. And so actually some of those things, like doing the shopping, I talk about that in the book, mm. turning up at someone's house for coffee, uh, knowing how to navigate my way through a social encounter, those things that I once thought I did by instinct, suddenly I found myself almost incapable of doing. One thing I found quite interesting um, myself was when you said about how you were trying to make it everything smaller, you were filling in gaps, you were putting up a coffee table. Yeah, yeah. So can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, sometimes they say, don't they, that um, you know, a wounded animal will slink away and find a, a small space for itself. And, and I felt a bit like that. You know, I found that the house felt too big, especially what you might have called the intimate spaces. You know, so the, the lounge where, right up to the end, really, you know, Fiona and I would have spent evenings together with her watching telly or falling asleep. I couldn't bear it. It felt too big. And I bought this whacking great coffee table and put it in the middle to make it feel smaller. Similarly, in our bedroom, which was beautifully proportioned and the furniture all fitted perfectly, I bought this big chunky old oak bookcase and stuck it in there to make it feel smaller. Because when you've lived in a house with two people and suddenly you live in it with one, all the proportions feel wrong. So four years later, yeah. do you feel that you're in a position now to have that space again or do you still like to keep it? I like it the way it is now. You like it the yeah. way it is, yeah. yeah. This particular wounded animal rather likes his den now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Postcards from Land of Grief, um, what is the heart of this book? The heart of this book is an honest and faith-filled account of what it feels like to go through grief. That's, that's the core of it. And so why did you choose to write your reflections as postcards? So you... So you start off with these reflections. Yeah. How, so obviously you were saying about when people go away, what do you write? Yeah. Postcards. But what was it that really resonated? Because initially, was it all in one go? It's like, right, I've got all these ideas, I'm going to write them down. Or was it something big than that? No, no, absolutely not. And I always feel a, a postcard is very different to a travelogue. You know, a travelogue you write down afterwards. You get home from your travels and you process them. Whereas a postcard you write, on the day. You say, this is how it feels to be in this place on this day. Now, when I was writing these postcards, which of course I didn't originally write for the book, when I was writing them, sometimes I would write two or three in a week. Sometimes mm. it would be three weeks in between writing them. And that was very deliberate. I didn't want them to become contrived. I wanted them to be a genuine response to what I was experiencing. Now, I knew that there were some that I would probably write. I would probably write on my 100th day as a widower. I would probably write on Fiona's birthday. I would probably write on our wedding anniversary. But apart from that, they came as and when. And I hope that that makes the book feel fresh. Mm, mm, absolutely. Well, it does. Good. It does. Good. But also, it's a way that people can identify as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and, and I think it encourages people who've either read it or listened to it to kind of walk through it with me. It doesn't feel like something that's all mapped out in advance. It feels like an encounter or a shared journey, perhaps, where you meet things along the way. I think producing this audio book, I certainly felt like that. Good. And yeah. there were moments when I just said to you, like, wow. And there was one, uh, one chapter, and it was just four lines, wasn't it? With the bench. Yeah. With the bench. And I was just blown away by them four lines. I was just like, goodness me. I was certainly there with you. And it's very emotional, um, this book as well. Um, but so honest. And I feel like, I feel that that's what people are going to really benefit from, that honesty. 
Yeah, and we're all uncomfortable with honesty around the areas of grief and bereavement, uh, partly because of personality, partly because of culture, I think. And if this can help to break through that, then it will be worth it. Elliot, there is no doubt this is the hardest book I have ever written. You know, um, when I was writing it, sometimes I couldn't write for longer than 15 minutes without bursting into tears. When you're writing a 200 page book, that means it takes a long time. And then, of course, when you get to the editing stage, you know, having to read stuff again and again and again, it was like driving the, driving the nail into the wood, you know. But the only thing that kept me going through all of that was the belief that it might be worth it and it might help somebody. And if it does, then I'm more than willing to have paid that price. One thing that you mentioned in your book towards the end, and it's one of the last things that people would have heard, yeah. is about keeping those few telephone numbers yeah. close by. Yeah. Now, as people handle grief and these topics in different ways, how have the people surrounding you, friends, family, how have they received this book? Many, many of them have appreciated it. Interestingly, I have probably had far more open and profound responses from those who don't know me. And I understand that totally. You know, grief is such a delicate subject. And of course, for my own family and for the friends who knew Fiona, they're grieving anyway. And they probably don't particularly want or need to interact with me about this book. So probably this has worked better for those who only know me through the book, because I think there's a degree of privacy for them in that. And so that's been probably where the engagement has been the most obvious. And you've got uh, three sons that you're have, extremely yeah. proud of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how, how have they received this book? They've all got a copy. And when I gave them the copy, I said, look, you may never, never, ever want to read this in your life, but I want you to have it. And I've left it at that. I've never asked them because they'll tell me if they need to. And Ginny the dog? Yeah, well, she had to put up with me writing it. You know? yeah. <laughs> she does get very bored when I spend too long at the desk and will tell me so. <laughs> does she do that look in, look in your eyes like you can take me out or what? Yeah, and if that doesn't work, she puts her front paws up on the desk. And if that doesn't work, she moves all my papers off the desk. <laughs> Fantastic. So, she is my sub-editor. Yeah. Beautiful. So what are your hopes for this book? The hopes are that it would meet people at their point of need, either in the land of grief or when a friend of theirs is going through the land of grief and would put something in their hands or in their ears that is going to help them. I, I think especially when a friend is going through the early stages of bereavement, we all feel quite ill-equipped to help them. And, and there's something quite anonymous about giving a person a book to listen to or to read. Because you're not going to be there when they do it. You can place it in their hands, you can give them the audiobook, and you can say, look, when you're ready and if you're ready, this might just be of help. And I'm particularly excited about the audiobook because there's something very intimate about audio. And also, none of us expect to sit down and listen to an audiobook in one go, in one hit. You know, we expect to listen to a snatch here and a snatch there. And I think that will make it even more accessible for people. Well, I was actually thinking about this. Um, when, when people experience grief, like they, hear it, they experience it in different ways. Mm. So though they may go for a walk by themselves, they may take themselves off somewhere, they may experience it with friends. But what an audiobook allows you to do, and certainly with your book, is they can take themselves away and they can have it themselves. No one needs to know what yeah. they're reading. No, they, yeah. they could just have in that moment yeah. to yeah. themselves. And I think they may actually revisit it. You know, the, the experience of recording this with you today has been great and you've made it very easy in so many ways. But actually, I've gone back through and processed some of those things again as I've read them out today. I don't know how many times I've read this stuff. But reading it again, there are different bits of the book which have touched me today as I've revisited those moments. Well, let's talk about the editing yep. process. Now, this isn't your sort of standard fiction book. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is intimate writing. Yeah. So how, how does one go about the writing process and the editing of creating a book like this? Well, I have to pay due credit, really, to the team at Authentic, who, this is going to sound odd, but they had a strange combination of being both hands-off and involved. You know, usually, an author writes a book, 
you submit it, it gets edited, it gets tweaked, it goes off. You know, with this, I kept a rolling conversation with Authentic because they recognized quite how vulnerable I was making myself by writing this. Mm. And so they really kind of held my hand the whole way. Having said that, there was very little at the editorial stage that got changed in terms of content. It's all my horrendous typos, you know, and all the words I'd put in too many times, all of that you expect. But I think they respected the material enough on this to really have very little input in terms of what was said in the book. Well, we love, here at Monkey Nut Audio Books, we love Authentic Media. They're, they are a great team. And I can see why they would be perfect for this as well. Um, your book is incredibly emotional. And there were times today when you were recording that we took some breaks. Yeah. yeah. Um, understandably. And something that resonated resonated with me and I wanted to bring it up now yeah, as yeah. well was when you were saying about when Fiona was um heavily into her illness that yeah. she was still texting um yeah. other people giving them support yeah. and advice and you refer to her as steadfast yeah yeah um you know we knew this was coming we talked a lot about her dying we talked a lot about the funeral we talked a lot about all kinds of stuff and uh, we were driving home from Cornwall. That's quite a long way. So I was stuck in the car. And she said, so how are you going to describe me at my funeral then? <laughs> what one word are you going to use? You know, and I couldn't get out of the car. I was driving the thing. And I thought, it didn't take very long, actually. It took less than a minute. And I said, steadfast. Big smile across her face. She said, oh, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said about me. And she was, you know, she was a um, fiercely loyal mother, an utterly supportive wife, and a steadfast Christian. And it hurts every day without her. But every day, I thank God for the days I had with her. And if Fiona picked up this book and read it, what do you think she'd say to you? She'd probably say, what do you write that bit for? <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I hope she would look at it and say, well, it was worth it then. You know, it, it, it was worth us talking about this as we did and you writing about it as you did. Uh, and we had had a conversation probably about a month before she died about how I was going to be afterwards. And uh, she said, oh, you know, what are you going to write about next? I said, well, I th I'm not sure I can write with a broken heart. And she gestured to all the medical paraphernalia around about her. She said, well, you could write about this. Mm. So I did write about this. And here we are. How have you managed to get on with your life whilst carrying the grief? Because as somebody who people depend on so much, Richard, yeah. How are you able to embrace that grief, to use it moving forward? Let me tell you a little story. There's uh, a guy called Ian e. Jackson, American author, who writes about grief. And he talks about the ranch on which he grew up. And around the edge of the ranch was uh, barbed wire, as you would expect. And he said in one place, there was a sapling that was chafing against the barbed wire and it just wouldn't grow. But a bit further on, there was a big old oak tree that had grown around the barbed wire and incorporated it. And that's me, I think. You know, so all of this that's in the book, the grief, the pain, the, the new light on some of my beliefs, that has become part of me now. So I, I never, ever want to move on from it, but I do grow with it. I, I had three months bereavement leave. And then when I got back into the pulpit, about two months into that, somebody came up to me at the door afterwards, you know, a lot of people do with preachers. <laughs> and they said, we're so glad you talk about Fiona in the pulpit because it makes it real. Mm. So glad you talk about what you're feeling. Now, it would be wrong to abuse that. You know, for goodness sake, if my poor church had to listen to me talking about how I feel on every sermon, I would be failing them. But I think I would also be failing them if it never came up. Mm. And so, you know, how, do, how have I moved on? I've moved on by incorporating this, like the barbed wire in the oak tree, and becoming a different shape as a result. And is that the advice that you would give to somebody else? If you had yourself sitting opposite you, what would you yeah. say to them? 
I would hesitate to give advice, but yes, I think so. I would say you, know, you, you can't move beyond this. You can only move on with it. In, in the same way, you know, when, when God's people were traveling across the desert, they, they carried the tabernacle with them. They carried God's presence with them. He didn't say, off you pop, I'll meet you the other side. And he said, I'll go with you. And so I would say, take, take this grief with you. You know, some days it will be so heavy, you'll have to put it down and stop. Other days, it will actually give you energy. You know, uh, it will actually be something you want to carry with you. But uh, yeah, keep it with you. Good advice. So I'd like to leave you with one last question, if yeah. I may. And that is, I mean, you've gone on some, I mean, I've known you for a while now, and I've known, I know a fraction of the wonderful work that you've done and doing, and you've done so much through the years and so much ahead. What would you say, bearing it with everything that's gone on with you yeah. in your life, if you had a 13-year-old you in front of you, what would you say to that person? I'd say, don't be afraid. I'd say, because when the worst thing happens, you'll not be alone. That's what I'd say. Richard Littledale, thank you so much.